This video explains ecological succession. It's the second video in the population studies. Ecological succession is a predictable pattern of gradual change over time in the types of species in a community following a disturbance. So the word succession means to like continue on from something. So ecological succession is how the ecosystem builds up and grows and how species continue to um, enter an area and make the area more complex. So it can start with um, an area that has never had species or so, such as plants and animals in that area, or it can be um, an area that used to have um, animals and plants and other species living there, but then there was um, a disturbance or a, a, a big change that caused the species to leave the area or to die. And um, then ecological succession would be how the species now re-enter the area and remake the area complex again. So the, those are the two types of succession. The first one's primary succession, which as I said, where there were no species before. So sites that have not previously had plants growing on them, places like beaches, lava flows, severe landslips, ponds, and bare rock. So where there was no soil, so no plants could grow. Secondary succession begins in areas where there's a disturbance that removes some or all of the species, but there's still soil remaining. Um, what determines a community structure? Well, we know that community structure is not static. It's constantly changing. It's determined over time by succession that takes place as a result of either or both of the following. The first one being disturbances and the second one being competitive interactions, which we'll get to just now. Disturbances can be things like physical disasters, storms, floods, fires, landslides, that sort of thing. It can be human or animal disturbances, like uh, abandoned crop fields, overgrazed areas, or forests that have been logged. And it can also be caused by climate change. They create new opportunities for new species to move in, species that were never there before. And these species will alter the character of the community and create an environment suitable to even more new species. Things, these are just examples of disturbances, volcanoes, landslides, forest fires, etc. Um, the other uh, thing that determines community structure is competitive interactions. Something like competitive exclusion, which we talked about in the previous video. And these occur between the organisms in a community, interspecies, um, interspecific competition, which would be between different species, and intraspecific competition, which would be between one species. Um, also things like predation, um, those sort of competitive interactions. And as I said, we discussed those in a previous video. So there's a few stages in ecological succession. The order of change is not random. It'll pretty much always happen the same over all types of um, ecological succession. The communities initially have a small number of simple species, and these are gradually replaced by a larger number of more complex species. There are three stages of ecological succession. The first is the pioneer species stage. The bare ground conditions favor pioneer, so early successional plant species. These species grow based where there's little competition for space and resources. So as the community evolves, these pioneer species will often die as other species come in because there's a more competition. Um, pioneer species have specific features. They are very hardy, they have to be able to withstand extreme variations in temperature and moisture and weather and that sort of thing because this community is quite new. Um, so there would be a lot of uh, variations in that sort of thing. The pioneer species must be able to establish rapidly. So they must be able to um, appear very rapidly, even though they might grow slowly once they've been established. Things like lichens. Lichens is a combination of fungus and an algae. These pioneer species must have spores or seeds that can disperse over long distances, um, like tiny seeds with parachutes that will uh, disperse very far away. It's pretty much always wind dispersal because there aren't um, other types of pollinators like insects that can, or not pollinators, um, disperses, things like insects and humans that can disperse seeds. Because um, it's such a new community, there wouldn't be animals and insects to disperse the seeds. So it's usually wind dispersal. And they have to disperse over long distances so that they can move away from the original um, place of um, existence and establishment, because as we know, these plants don't like, a comp don't like competition. And they usually don't grow in the shade. 
because there is no shade, because there's no um, trees or anything in this community yet. Things like grass would be something like that. Um, pioneer species prepare the surroundings for later colonists by altering the biotic, so the living, and the abiotic, the non-living environment. Pioneer species build up, stabilize, and enrich the soil. So if there was no soil before, pioneer species would actually produce the soil. And if there was soil before, they'd begin to stabilize and enrich it and add nutrients, that sort of thing. Their roots are usually the things that stabilize the soil. Um, soil is the most important abiotic factor that the pioneer species are in, in charge of affecting. Pioneer species also alter the amount of light available as they might provide shade. These changes allow other species, which are better suited to this now modified habitat, to then come in and replace the pioneer species, and the pioneer species will usually disappear because they don't like competition. Obviously, something like grass might remain, but a lot of pioneer species will then uh, die and establish themselves in different communities that are still at the um, primary, the pioneer species stage. Um, the following things, things like lichens are floral pioneer species. Obviously lichens are one of the first species to become established because they can establish themselves on rock. They don't need soil to survive. Um, soil forms as the lichens and um, other types of weathering will break down the rocks into smaller pieces. Um, and then these lichens will die and decompose and add some organic matter, so add some nutrients to the soil. Um, this obviously could take many years. Um, after the lichens have formed, there's also some mosses and other very simple plants that follow. Then once the soil begins to thicken, things like ferns, grasses and annuals arrive. Um, the, then there's also animal pioneer species, which would be things like mites, ants and spiders, so insects, uh, very small herbivores, um, insects, rodents, and some small birds, and other decomposers that will decompose the pioneer species, things like earthworms. They'll move in when there's more food available. Um, what the, we then go on to secondary succession. So we already looked at the primary succession, which is when um, there was uh, no soil before. So what, that's what, when we would need uh, lichens and things to break down the rocks and form soil. For the pioneer species of um, secondary succession, where there was already soil before, it would be things like annuals. Um, they would usually be the first to appear after a disturbance. Um, after a little while, um, after a little while, there'd also be grasses and some perennials that appear. And in the forest, if there are um, wetter sites or in the gaps of the forest, some climbers might develop. Uh, I spoke about annuals and perennials. The difference between them is that perennials are flowers and plants that grow year after year um, and they just are dormant during winter. They won't bloom during winter. Annuals are plants that are usually planted or grow in the spring and then they'll bloom in the spring and summer and then they'll die. So annuals are plants that usually only live for a year, whereas perennials will live for many years. Um, we then move on after the pioneer species stage to the intermediate species stage. One of the important things to note about the pioneer species stage is just to know the difference between what happens and what are the pioneer species in primary succession and if there's secondary succession. So what's the difference there? Um, after primary and secondary succession, no matter whether it was primary or secondary, we move on to the intermediate species stage. Ecological conditions can change because the soil can now hold more water than before and it's a lot more fertile. Sorry, that should be more. Uh, the temperatures are a lot less extreme because we have more shade, because some plants have grown in. Because of this, there's a greater variety and a greater number of organisms that can move in. As the soil builds up, some non-woody herbaceous species, um, so leafy species, um, these give way to the small hardy and more woody plant species. And then these in turn, um, they give way to larger woody shrubs and bushes that are a lot more slow growing. Uh, the grasses will remain part of the community um, throughout all the stages. And at a later stage, some species can grow when there's a proper amount of shade. Some more herbivores will enter, things like hares and small antelope, small carnivores. Obviously, in an African community, these would be things like caracal, African wild cats. Um, snakes can come, and there'll also be raptors, so larger birds, um, predatory birds, can become part of the community. 
And because in this intermediate state, there are more species and a greater variety of species, it makes the community more structurally complex. The last stage of um, ecological succession is the climax community. It's a semi-stable stage. Um, it's obviously a plant, a community, as we said, is never stable, but it's semi-stable, so it's more stable than these two previous stages. We can also say it's the end point of succession. Obviously, it's not the end as in it's now fixed and stable, but it's the end because it's semi-stable and the ecosystem has fully developed. It's more complex. Climax communities are very varied. They can be large trees like a forest. They can be more savannary. They can be succulent shrubs, shrubs such as in the succulent karoo biome. It obviously depends on the climate of the area, which species have come in, the location of the area, and so on. Um, this climax community, as we said, um, can vary. So it can be look like that, and it can look like that. Obviously, we talked about in the intermediate stage how there would be more larger woody shrubs and possibly even trees that grow. But then you look at this community and say, well, there's no big woody trees. They looks like very small um, shrubs. So is this a climax community? The answer is yes, it is. It doesn't always have to follow this exact pattern and these exact types of species, but the general pattern is the same. And this is semi-stable. It's not constantly changing. There's not constantly new species arriving. So it is a climax community. Uh, the animal species in the climax community are the most diverse and they are large herbivores and carnivores. Obviously not in all climax community, but in most of them. It's important to realize that everything is still in a state of transition. It's not constantly stable anymore. There's still future disturbances that can cause the, the species of a community to change. For example, in a place like the succulent Karoo, if the climate changes and there's higher rainfall, it can turn into a, grass a grassland. That's why it's semi-stable and not just stable. All over the world, humans are destroying these climax communities as they are changing the climate, they are creating disturbances. As a result, climax communities are becoming increasingly rare because they take so long to develop. Um, sorry. What factors determine an endpoint to a community? Any community, if it's pioneer, successional, or climax community, um, whether it's intermediate, climax, pioneer, it can change. There are a few things that are the most important factors in determining how it changes and um, what the end point will look like. It can be caused by environmental fluctuations, such as rainfall. This is probably the most important factor that determines what the end point of a community looks like. Um, if the rainfall is more than 1,200 millimeters per year, approximately, the end point is usually a forest community. If there's a prolonged drought, Species that are able to withstand drier conditions will start to dominate, as opposed to those who need a lot of rainfall and water to survive. And the character of the forest community will change into a grassland or savanna endpoint. Another factor determining the endpoint can be overgrazing. This is obviously uh, related to human activities, as humans control um, cattle and everything, but there can also be animals that aren't controlled by humans that can overgraze. Um, things like she sheep in the Karoo only eat select a few grasses, only eat the palatable herbs and small shrubs. So the uneaten, unpalatable species will become dominant as they're not being eaten and they'll form the end point. Grazers often choose one grass species and they'll, they'll then only eat that grass species. This changes the composition of the climax communities in the grassland biome. This is seen in the tall grassland areas in the KwaZulu Natal. They're normally dominated by fat grass. But um, if overgrazing has occurs, the less palatable cattail drop seed becomes the dominant grass, not the thatch grass anymore. Um, another factor that determines the endpoint to the community is the draining of wetlands. And obviously, this is human controlled. Often, humans will drain wetlands to build um, uh, urban areas or to plant crops. And this obviously permanently alters the environment. It can um, result in the dis disappearance of the wetland climax species, things like frogs, reeds, birds, fish, and so on. Um, another factor is climate change. This is obviously very important um, these days. Um, climate change will definitely affect successional endpoints, i.e. some um, grass and parts of the Congo have become wetter um, as climate has changed, and they've changed into forest communities from the grassland um, communities. 
countries in East Africa, like Kenya, have, may have become a lot drier, and it will obviously change their climax community as well. Um, areas that have previously been quite fertile may become more arid as the climate gets drier. And the last factor determining the endpoint is in invasion by alien species. So invasive species replace the once dominant species, the indigenous species. And this, an example of this could be the Trifid weed. It's a category one invasive plant. It's invaded the grassland, savanna, and forest biomes. Um, and it's taken over and become the dominant species. It can be seen in parts like the Shishlui game reserve. An important thing to note is the difference between alien species and invasive alien species. Alien species that aren't naturally found there. Oh, alien species are species that are not naturally found in the area, so they're not indigenous to the area, but they don't really affect other species. Invasive alien species are species that are not naturally found there, so they're not indigenous, and they negatively affect other species. They take over other species. So the tripod weed is an invasive alien species. Um, sorry, this slide keeps popping up, but it's not meant to be there. Um, so that's basically all of ecological succession. It's important to know the stages, the difference between primary and secondary succession, and some of the factors that determine the endpoint of the community.